Uh, starting with uh, uh, James Peng, he's the uh, user acquisition and monetization guy at Storm8. Uh, we have uh, next to him Andrew Byrne Breyer, uh, the director of business development in North America at AppLift. And I forgot how, I forgot to ask you how you pronounce your last Brooke. name, so Matt. Okay, Matt Bruck, sales manager, Liquid Wireless. Um, so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, uh, we did a story this morning on uh, Ad Colony and uh, a survey they did um, of 4,000 developers that said uh, app installs were the priority for everybody two years ago, but now everybody says, uh, all the developers say that getting high quality downloads uh, is what they want. And uh, we also, at VentureBeat, we started this uh, research division called VB Insight, and uh, we did a user acquisition report as well. Uh, a survey of 230 developers, um, and uh, they, they sort of voted on what uh, sort of solutions for user acquisition they liked. And uh, the rankings uh, that came out in order uh, were number one, Facebook, uh, Google, Chartboost, Ad Colony, Flurry, Tapjoy, YouTube, Twitter, NativeX, and Playhaven. So for our panel, i just open it up. Uh, uh, actually, say a little bit more, introduce yourselves a little bit more, um, and then I'll ask you a question based on that list there. Uh, so my name is James Peng. I lead user acquisition and monetization at Storm8. Um, Storm8 is a mobile developer. We have more than 40 titles on iOS and Android um, across multiple genres. We have 50 million, um, 50 million users that play our games every single month. And we were a top 12 mobile publisher in 2013 um, based on worldwide iOS and Android revenue. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. I'm Andrew Burnbrier. I'm the director of business development for AppLift. AppLift is a mobile games focused marketing platform. We work with 90 of the top 100 game pubs around the world. Uh, I think currently we have 178 active uh, game publishers on board. And we focus on ROI positive spending. How do we do that? We have a very high level LTV optimization and uh, an advertiser dashboard that allows you to optimize your campaigns. And in turn, we work with 3,000 plus media partners across a variety of different channels, everything from uh, apps to mobile web to OEMs to strategic partners. We're even doing TV now. Uh, We've got retargeting, we've got social, we've got some very cool uh, tech on our back end, and uh, we connect the supply with the demand and make sure that we drive you high quality users. My name is Matt Bruck. I'm the sales manager for Liquid Wireless, uh, which is Publishers Clearinghouse's uh, rich media ad network. Um, PCH uh, each year spends $36 million on advertising for direct response, uh, TV, um, and a whole slew of other um, sort of ad campaigns. Um, and when users come to our sites, we then monetize them with app downloads, um, direct response advertisers, um, and a whole variety of other ways. So uh, uh, you guys heard that list. Uh, I repeat it here in a, a second. Uh, but what do you what do you think about this list? What, like, what does it tell you about the sort of state of user acquisition today? Uh, that uh, developers would say that the the top um, Folks for user acquisition that they would use are Facebook, Google, Chartboost, Ad Colony, Flurry, Tapjoy, YouTube, Twitter, NativeX, and Playhaven. So let's go. Sure. So um, I guess I'll answer. The, so at the list, um, obviously, there's a lot of different types of vendors there. And what it does show you is that there's a lot of different sort of needs in the marketplace. And each vendor that, that is showing up there is, is there for a reason. And I think um, best is very subjective. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. And, if you're trying to compile a leaderboard based on different objective, whether it's sort of quality, volume, uh, price, you're going to have a completely different board. Um, I would say, like with sort of the combination of all these elements, um, looking at sort of volume, quality, targeting, and uh, price, um, Facebook is rightly in the position it is right now. But um, you know, the, the I would say the arena is changing quite a bit, and um, recently, especially this year, the competition is increasing. There's a lot of targeting options that are um, becoming available. You know, things like Twitter and Google are starting to emerge, but um, and I, th I feel like this um, this chart will continue to sh evolve and shift over the next year. I I don't say that I agree in a lot of ways with James. I think that they left off one particular name off that list, <laughs> which is a little company called AppLift. <laughs> 
Thanks. Um, it, it really it comes down to, like James said, what do you do best, right? And everyone does things slightly different. So it's about focus. It's about how you're going to deliver it. Uh, I think we can all agree that Facebook does a great job. Facebook also does a great job because you give them every bit of data on you and you tell them exactly how to market to you, right? That's, so if you gave me everything about you, I'm pretty sure I could sell you something you want. Right? So it makes sense that they can drive high value, drive high quality, because it's all about targeting. But it's also about focus. So Applif, we're 100% games. We know games. We know how to find the users for your games. Right? So if that was a list for who are the top mobile ad networks for games, I think we'd be number one. But what we, did, what we can say is that everyone on that list does things very well. Right? NativeX is a very cool platform that I, I think is, is head and shoulders above what a lot of people are doing. Um, and I think that Twitter, I mean, in and of itself, it's going to be a really big platform for the future. Right? Being able to really utilize that reach and for individuals to push, I think we all can accept based on the quality of fa Facebook that Twitter is really it's, it's the next step in social. Right? Um, but overall, these lists are somewhat subjective right? because it's based on small sample sizes, it's based on individual experiences, and I think that the more people you, you, you reach out to, the more people you talk to, you're going to find they have pros and cons for each person in that list, right? There's, there's someone who loves some people on those lists, there's some people that don't appreciate what those people do on the list, but what I can say for sure is that they each deliver a product that has high value. Yeah, I mean, um, if you think about just Stormy, like a major app developer in the space, they use AppLift as their main agency for acquiring downloads outside of sort of these big guys. So just to give them a lot of credit, but then, you know, to use our company as an example, um, this time last year, we actually did not have very much of a presence in the app space. Um, we were doing less than 10,000 installs a month. Um, and over the last year, we've kind of scaled that to um, over 300,000 installs per month. And a lot of partners, um, especially in the, the social gaming, social casino space, now consider us to be one of their top um, partners in terms of quality. So if you think about that, you know, we didn't exist very much uh, this time last year. Um, AppLift's obviously grown a lot. Um, so I think a lot of players are coming to the space and growing and, and showing that they can provide a lot of value. And um, I think those top lists will continue to kind of shake up more and more. So I think uh, Fixu is about to report their June uh, results for uh, the surveys they do on the, the cost of user or, uh, of getting a loyal user, uh, which is somebody who opens an app like three times or so. Um, and uh, I believe that uh, you know the numbers right now are, are basically at four-year highs, I guess. And uh, uh, the costs are. Um, what, what, what would you guys say? Observe about the costs right now of getting new users. Um, if I said you had to spend a dollar fifty to make two dollars, would you spend that dollar fifty? Yeah. If I told you you had to spend ten dollars to make fifteen dollars, would you spend that ten dollars? It's all about ROI positive spending, and I can't stress that enough, right? What we can do, and what I think pretty much every provider on that list and is everyone's trying to do, is to deliver that ROI positive spend. If you can only spend $1, then let's find you a user that's equal to $1.50, right? And if, if it's all the way up the board, then we're going to find you that commensurate user, right? You should only be paying for what is going to provide you an ROI positive return, right? So yes, prices are going up. That's a simple factor of supply and demand, right? There's more and more publishers on board that are like, hey, we need to get users. We want to get more users. We realize that driving them to our game is the only way to get to the charts, the only way to start making money. But ultimately, it's about finding those high quality users. So if you partner with someone who can deliver a user that's worth more than what you're spending, then the price has no impact, right? Because no matter what, if you're making money, then it's a win. I'll say from our perspective, um, we definitely feel that price, uh, the fact that these price increases. You know, as the prices go up, there sort of is a theoretical maximum of how much you really can squeeze out of every single user. So, you know, the margin does get squeezed. But I will say, if, if as costs go up, um, you know, we have to be smarter. And um, e even though the, the cost of the users, uh, valuable and engaged users, is going up, um, what, what I've seen is actually the prices of the sort of non-valuable or crappy users is actually sort of decreasing a little bit because um, advertisers are getting smarter about what they, not only what they want, but what they don't want. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to counter a lot of these costs by making our spend more impactful for every single um, impression that we show out there. 
And we do that by you know, um, understanding who our users are, what they want, and how to, how to most effectively communicate that to them. And that's essentially another way of just saying, you know, understand the source, understand the destination, and understand the medium in which you're going to communicate that. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, in, in order for a campaign to work, I think both sides need to be winning, right? So um, like Andrew was saying, if, you know, just being ROI positive is obviously huge, but you want to make it so that the publisher is in a place where they're, um, you know, backing out to an effective CPM that works for them so that they can go out and you know, increase you know, the spend that they're doing to bring in more, um, more users. Um, and I think you gotta kind of find a strike of balance um, so that both sides are winning. And that way, um, you know, ultimately, we, you know, for us, that can help us deliver more volume you know, to move into the app space. We really had to find a way for it to compete with the direct response advertisers, the auto insurance companies that have been working on our platform for a while. Um, and I think some of those increased costs helped us transition into the space. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. So I guess if you look at the iOS and the, the top uh, downloads uh, uh, for apps, uh, you, you'll see that the list keeps changing, uh, maybe every month or so. But the list that doesn't change is the top grossing apps list, you know, the top five. Uh, there's been one change, uh, I guess the addition of the, the Kim Kardashian app is they're, they're now in the, the top five. Uh, but the, the top four pretty much have have not changed, and I, I wonder what you guys think about um, about the user acquisition behavior you see among the top five, and then how everybody else should sort of think about that or deal with it. I guess in in some way. I'll use both. I'll talk out of both of these. I'm that excited about it. <laughs> um, I think that the, what, you, what you can see from these top game pubs and the reason they're in the market is because they, they, they put emphasis on spreading the word, right? So I'm not just talking about doing app installs, right? There's a lot of different ways to drive users, right? You want to have eyes in your game. You want to have people talking about your game. You have to have friends playing the game so that you compete against them. I think one of the biggest factors I've seen is the social competition, right? I I play Candy Crush so much, I'm a level 357, FYI, um, because all my buddies are playing them and I want to beat them, right? My, my boss, uh, Hanno Fickner, is like a level 500 something ridiculous and that constantly, that carrot out there keeps me going more and more. And so when you have games that have that addictive quality, that have that, that aspect where you want to compete against your friends, then you're more likely to spend, right? So it's about creating a game that's exciting that, that in turn will drive revenue into it, right? The games that you guys have built are so addicting that people have to spend money because there's like, I, that the, the only way I can, I can keep going, the only way I can get the amount of enjoyment that I want is I'm gonna have to spend, right? And that's the type of metric that you want, that's the type of engagement feature that you're looking for in games, right? Is that, is that almost addictive aspect. Um, I will say that the games that are in the top grossing, obviously you'll see a lot of ads from everywhere because they do have big marketing budgets and um, you know, all of them have a lot of different strategies and um, have spent a lot of time on their product to get it there. At Stormate, um, you know, we consistently in 2013 have um, had six apps in the top 100 grossing. And uh, you know, we have a bit different um, type of strategy to, uh, in, in terms of look, being on the grossing charts. And even though we can afford to pay more by having a lot of grossing games, um, you know, we view user acquisition as a business. So just because we can't pay more, we don't necessarily do so. Um, you know, viral virality and marketing budget is sort of, is still really key for visibility. Um, but I think it still is possible for smaller players to make it in the marketplace by you know buying on an ROI positive basis and focusing on sort of the the core economics of your game. I mean, on, on our side, we've actually seen um, some app developers who are lower on the charts um, outcompete some of the higher players um, in terms of you know doing things right on the creative front. Um, we've seen a lot of times the size of the app can have a huge impact on how many installs you get on our platform. So we've had people actually bidding twice as high on our platform and actually getting fewer installs than some of the, the smaller players who come in take a lot of uh, pride in the creative that they're making, um, maybe put some more effort towards the banner ads or things like that that the users are actually seeing before they get inside the app. We've actually gone to studios before and you know, they've got this huge creative team working on the inside of the app, you know, the gameplay, all that experience, and we'll go, well, you know, where's the banner ad? You know, who's making that? And 
they're like, well, someone does that, you know, uh, during their intern time or something like that. So um, we've seen, you know, you really have to focus on the front end too. You got to get the user into the game before. So what would you consider to be something creative uh, on the business side, uh, sort of in the face of all these obstacles for user acquisition? And so, like, you know, there's a lot of creativity on the the art side, or you know, creating the game and all that. Like, um, what gets you excited about, you know? being creative uh, on the business side here. I was going to I was going to echo what Matt said. I mean, uh, a lot of people think that just because you spend a bunch of money people are going to play your game, and that's not really the case. And that's part of the reason why some of these UA costs have gone up is because people don't spend the time to focus on the creative and then they just dump money expecting, "Oh, it'll just happen, right? If I show my ads enough times, people are going to download it." So, what I would say and kind of what what you're saying is the, the front end creative is take the time if you've put, if you made this passion project, the game, right, you have all these artists in the game that are developing all these cool features and 3D engagement and all that sort of stuff, put that, like you said, into the banners. Or at least give us, give, give Matt, give some of these other guys here in the audience, give us the, 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 the PNG files and then we can build them out, right? But don't just expect that if you have a banner with no engaging, with no engaging topics, nothing in there for me to click on it and want to go download it. Right? You have to have something that looks cool, that looks exciting. I think some of our best performing games actually have fairly low CPIs because it's a fun game, right? Like I, I, don't, I don't think, it, James isn't out here spending a ridiculous amount of money for each title, but what he's built is a cool game and then taking the time in the creatives to make it seem like it's fun and exciting before you've ever played it, right? If you can mimic that experience before you've actually started playing the game, then you're going to get someone to go into the game and realize, oh wow, this is really great, I want to play it. Another interesting aspect that you can spend a little bit of time on is, um, the, you know, creatives are obviously the top of the funnel, but what about the bottom of the funnel? You can focus a little bit on app store optimization and um, think about the elements that really um, sort of expand the bottom of the funnel and, and help you to fill more users in. So spend a lot of time optimizing your creative, but, um, you know, that, that's applicable directly to the, your advertising spend. What about um, you know what everyone sees like on your landing page and things like that? Uh, that's something that we found that to be extremely effective as well. So I think there's a lot of ways to um, you know apply your resources and apply um, sort of your uh, you know apply apply your resources and um, sort of exponentially grow your ability to um, to get users in, into your network. Uh, I'm gonna sort of change it up a little and ask if anybody's got a good question right now. <laughs> All right, out there. Um, Someone always loses. Can somebody sort of summarize that question as well? I'm wondering why has but somebody been able to make a really top grossing Quisk games? I think Quisk games are good, but I haven't seen any Quisk games that are just really, really good. Monetizing, popular, I mean, you know, you know what I mean? I'm just saying Quisk is a pretty popular category across families, across friends, top Quisk is whatever. So quiz up, right? Yeah, yeah quiz up, quiz duel. I, I, can everyone hear me with that microphone? I don't think I necessarily need one. I talk too loud anyways. Um, mm -hmm. But what, what, what he said was, why, why don't quiz games monetize so well, and why do they just kind of come and go, right? If they're, if they're all about competition, and I made the comment earlier about games that have a social competition aspect become very sticky, why don't quiz games move up and, and stick around for so long? Um, I think there's a couple of different things there, but the, the first one that really jumped at me is in a quiz game, someone always loses. Right? And someone walks away not feeling as smart. So it's fun to be the one that's winning every time, but when you lose to your friend, you're like, this game sucks. I don't want to play. There's been a, I've, I've been playing a lot of quiz up where the person drops out halfway in between, and it's like, partner has left the game. Because they're like, I'm going to lose. I'm done. Right? And nobody likes that. That's just not fun. So when you, have some, when you have that aspect where you have the ability to not feel quite as smart at the end, that's a little tough. 
But then also, I would look at the monetization aspect of it, right? You have to have the right payment walls in your game, and some games do it very well, right? They get you hooked, you feel like it's fun, and you're like, oh, here's a cool new feature, right? Like, like Clash of Clans, they, they add in new characters that you have to buy, right? Okay, so that's uh, cool. I can play or I can buy it, right? But a game like Quiz Up, what are they going to give you that you would spend money on, right? Like, so don't, don't make a game that pisses people off, right? Yeah. And then... Um, I, I think the family feud style games then would sort of be more suitable towards, uh, I guess, retaining audiences then because you're really not asking somebody's level of trivia knowledge or whatever, or just you know how much they know about sports or something like that. You're asking whether they can accurately guess at what people answered in a survey or something like that, which doesn't take special knowledge, right? Um, so, so, so a family feud style game might do better than a quiz game, is my guess. Right. Yeah, I mean, one thing in these quiz games is a little rem reminiscent of, um, you know, Words with Friends and that, that thing. It was a little bit of a novelty, and it was fun back then, but for me, it quickly lost, you know, a spark. And um, games like that, typically, they rise really quickly in the ranks, and they get a lot of visibility, but um, sort of, as Andrew said, that monetization factor is really, really tough. Very rarely do you see, like, Words with Friends being, like, number one grossing, right? So they may get a lot of vir virality and a lot, a lot of user base, um, but I... It's it's tough to, for those to um, you know there's not a lot of motivation for me or you to pay a lot of money to I don't know beat this guy or more ch more tries whatever the mechanic is so I have um, I have trouble seeing that um, as a big grossing factor. Got another question in the back. Uh, talking talking about uh, player retention and uh, engagement, uh, push messaging is probably one of the most important uh, channels for that. What does the panel think is the best push message that you can send to a user to to get them back into your app? some ideas. I'm the first one that's talking. Your about village it. has burned down, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, have it be pertinent to the game, have it be something that's going to catch my eye and, and have some fun, right? Like that's, I think is really important. Uh, you don't want it to be spammy. You don't want it to happen too often, right? I, I, I turn off push notifications when I'm getting them multiple times a day to come do the same thing. Like, hey, we haven't seen you in a while. Come back in here. No. But how about like, you know, the, oh, uh, just so you know, this new feature just got rolled out. Come check it out, right? Or, or hey, we just added this for you. Or hey, we've missed you. Here's a free life, right? Something like that. Like, give me a little something that's going to be like, oh, shoot, I actually forgot that I was doing that instead of just haven't seen you in a while because that's like the most common one is hey we haven't seen you in this app for a while come 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 back we miss you like well, okay that's you're being needy <laughs> I don't uh, give me my space you know but if it's like hey I mean if you want to you know like you can come play because we've got this cool thing that like everyone else loves but I mean I guess you don't then I'm like all right I gotta go check it out <laughs> yeah. I think to me oh. Yeah, one thing that we've seen work uh, with some of our partners is actually giving the user something special. So um, whether it's you know an app where you need currency in order to to advance in a level, you know if the user hasn't come during a certain duration of days, you know maybe you give them a couple extra you know tokens or you know 50 extra tokens when you know they didn't want to buy anymore at, at some point. Um, we've seen that do really well uh, with different partners. Uh, personaliz personalization is a huge thing too. Um, you know, if the user feels like you're recognizing them as someone who's important to the game, um, that tends to work pretty well. Um, if it's a blanket statement and they, they can read through that, you're generally not going to have as much success. So, I, I personally like the sort of um, notes that have a little bit of utility, like you see Clash of Clans, like, you know, your troops are ready, or this person attacked you, really enjoy those things. Um, and the, another way to look at it is you can offer an incentive. Um, the way I would value it is, you know, re-engagement re is a big theme in 2014, probably will be next year, but sort of like what's the cost of re-engaging and, you know, what would you have been spending otherwise if you can um, share some sort of virtual value uh, for less than that, then why not? Hey, uh, do you guys see programmatic media basically self-optimizing creative and retargeting starting to take over the space? Is it becoming more prominent, less prominent? We've heard a lot about it, but not recently, essentially. I keep being the first. <laughs> Go first. <We're> good. <laughs> All right. I know. I, I do think it's very important. Um, I think that uh, as just time has told us, right, the more the more you can put onto an automated path, no matter what it is, right. Like building cars, we used to build them by hands, and it got better when we started doing it on a conveyor belt, right. 
Um, so there's a lot of different aspects that I think could benefit from that. Um, like Dean said earlier though, this isn't a science. There is a bit of a black magic to it, a little bit of art, right? So there you have to still have that personal touch and know where to fine tune it. But yeah, anything that you can help build up your database and know, yes, based on 1,000 campaigns, a creative com uh, competed better than B creative, then great. When I, when I do a manual, when I reach out and say, I want to start this campaign, I'm going to start with A because I have a better likelihood of it doing well, but I'm still going to run some B too. So you have to have some aspect of that in play, and, and you, can, you can never just turn it down. But programmatics has become very, very important, but right now it's still such a small component of what we do, of just the, the market in general, that um, you still you have to have that personal touch, but use it. You should be doing as much A-B testing as you possibly can, right? Because that's the only way you're going to know what works or doesn't. Like, you can have 10 different creatives, uh, 10 different traffic sources, and if you're just running them and you're getting a big pool of conversions, then that's great. You have users, but you don't really have anything else. So you should be collecting as much data as possible. And that's what we try to do when we're doing our LTV optimization for our clients is give us all the possible data we can and let us utilize that to find the right user for you. Let's let you know this is what's better versus this, right? Um, yeah, speaking of, there, yeah, speaking of finding the right user, Facebook knows so much about our customers and using lookalikes and or targeting specific interests and demographics. Uh, everything we tried in addition to that hasn't worked out and we want it to work out because Facebook is also a bidding madhouse where we're competing against our competitors and the bid prices go through the roof every time we try to increase volume. How are you guys addressing the need to target specific demographics and, so and psychographics for the advertising? How do you cut Facebook out? Or uh, I mean, one, one thing, so Publishers Clearinghouse actually has um, data on 100 million Americans um, that have come through our, our system. Um, so when you think about Facebook and, you know, a publisher that obviously has a lot of data, I think, you know, there are other publishers out there that have a tremendous amount of data as well. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, we're one of them and there's, and there's got to be a bunch more that, that can kind of step in the space and, you know, you can move outside of Facebook kind of where the, the discussion started. Facebook's kind of the primary driver. I think a lot of people focus most of their UA efforts there, but I think sort of on the fringe, there's going to be a lot more players coming into the space that have first party data and lots of it um, who might not have been a household name before, but, but can drive a lot of value and, and provide value. And, you know, if you're looking for a user that, you know, is male under the age of 25 who lives in a specific zip code, you know, we can provide that for you. And, and I think there are others out there that can do that too. Yeah, so Facebook right now is obviously one of the most powerful targeting um, tools out there, but you know, that's changing a lot and a lot more options are becoming available as you've seen. Um, Twitter's, you know, their CPI tools now starting to become available to the public and um, you know, you see like Google is really giving a, a, a giving a lot more or producing a lot more products that have um, these their targeting capabilities that do leverage their data. Um, vendors like Amazon are starting to enter the space. Uh, a lot of vendors are just becoming a lot more transparent. If you buy on like um, you know D uh, across exchanges on DSP, like you can start to leverage a lot of data sources to enrich um, enrich the users that you're targeting. So I mean, I think um, as you see, like month over month, year over year. Um, I'll, these capabilities and these um, new new channels are becoming more viable and more available. So Facebook isn't going to sort of be the I think an all be all at the end of the day. There's going to be um, new competitors to the space that they're going to be able to buy through. What do you what do you think of brand new innovations like playable ads, like from M Nectar? I think they look super cool. Uh, I really hope that they get to a point where they're very playable and there's no lag. Um, what I've noticed so far is that. Uh, the demos that I've seen, the, um, the idea of it's very cool, but the actual uh, implementation and playthrough has been a little choppy. But if it's seamless, that'd be awesome, right? It's like, oh, shoot, this, this is a pretty cool game. I don't know exactly who would want to have that in their game. Like, cross-promo sounds like a great, great platform, but I don't know if James is going to be like, yeah, let's have a, a, a first playable level of, of Clash of Clans uh, you know, after someone beats level three of Candy Bus, right? Like, I don't, I don't know if that's going to be the, 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 the best tie-in, but for cross-promo, that'd be super cool, right? If it's clean, there's no lag, that's, I like that. Over here. What are the best retargeting tools you guys are seeing right now? 
What are the best? And add, explain retargeting too. Um, so retargeting is obviously like you have, you have a list of IDs that you've identified as valuable to you, and then you'll go out because you want to find them, and maybe and some some people take it further and find lookalikes, you know, users that fit the same profile. Um, I would say a lot of a lot of ad networks are starting to offer retargeting. Um, you know, Tap Commerce are obviously the guys that sort of were there before anyone else. Um, Facebook and a lot of the you know larger platforms are also offer, offering it now. Um, I would say it's becoming pretty ubiquitous, but um, retargeting is also dependent on um, you know how much data you have. I would say you need quite a lot of installs before um, you can really leverage retargeting at scale because you know again I would say most developers um, the payer profile is still somewhere between one to five percent payer conversion so you know it's still not a, not a ton of data so the question is really do you want to spend your time acquiring like sort of a thousand new users or retargeting um, you know a smaller pool of users and it's highly dependent on how much how well your game is monetized in the first place. Does that answer your question? Other questions? Ernie back there. Has anybody uh, explored uh, email on retargeting? Because it seems like, I don't know, I haven't found a solution at all. And every time we go shopping, we always get an email all the time when we engage in email. Has, has anybody, retar has <laughs> anybody explored email retargeting? We don't, we don't do it directly. We know some people that do it. I think there's uh, some pitfalls in, in that, right? Um, there's all sorts of uh, do not mail lists and stuff like that, so you have to be really careful. Um, and usually when you're getting, like if you're shopping at say Nordstrom and they're like, do you want us to email your receipt? And then they hit you up with some other emails, you're getting emails directly from Nordstrom. So that would be something in terms of a retargeting I think would be very cool uh, for your own platform. But like James said, you have to have uh, a large user base already to start doing that. But that seems like one that would be a pretty straightforward metric, right? Like you, you have your, your game players, get their email, and then shoot them, shoot them a message. Um, you know, how much are we engaging with our email on our phone? Probably quite a bit, but not as much as, say, getting a push notification from within the app itself, right? Like if you get that email while you're on your desktop or on your, on your laptop in the office, cool, you saw it, but you're not really gonna go right back into the game. But if you have a retargeting campaign that's specifically to mobile, and you include a deep link that takes someone directly to the level that they were in, that's hyper, hyper effective. Just to add one thing, some of the partners that we work with have, have said they've had trouble attributing the value. Is it the person who generated that install, or is it the person who created that, that retargeted user? So. Yeah, I think that, I don't know if that's something that you've experienced as well, but. I mean, we haven't had a lot of experience email retargeting. I just, um, we, you know, we tend to focus on, um, you know, either using push or, um, or just new sources. So, I mean, we don't spend a lot of time on that. So here's a question I want you to think about for a while and then not answer right away. Uh, what's the best tip you have for the audience? So, any more questions? Elsewhere. Uh, oh, sorry, in back. Yeah, how does uh, user acquisition work in markets that aren't using Facebook or email as much, for instance, China? How is user acquisition different there, and do you guys have any recommendations? International Thanks, question. Mike. Um, well, China is like, well, we have a whole another, another panel just for that, but um, <laughs> I would say you definitely have to understand, if you want to target a specific country, know what the top channels are, know what the top social networks, you just got to know it. You have to do your homework, especially if you really want to be there. Um, like, you know, if you're in Brazil, I think, uh, what was the top one there, like Orkut or something, or... Yeah, there's just, but anyways, you have to know like um, the specific channels that will succeed. That what people actually use. Um, if you're if you're serious about it, go there, figure it out, figure out what people, how people interact with their apps. But um, you know, um, I, I would say, like for example, um, uh, like Twitter is very concentrated in certain geos. Um, you know, there's there's and there's also networks that are very specific to those geos. So if you want to get very niche, uh, spend some time and um, talk to people that, talk to developers and um, networks that focus specifically on those areas. China is what, like probably the toughest UA market out there. 
Um, so if you're going to target China, I would recommend working with someone who has a very strong foothold in Asia because they just do business very differently than how we would do it here. And the way they reach clients is differently. I mean, I, I'm sure most of you know they have, I think, over 190 app stores right now. I think they're popular, you know, they're, they're dominated by five. But still, you have to have individual relationships with each of these app stores. They all have their own, their own reasons for why they would promote an app versus another. They have different revenue shares and stuff like that. So generally speaking, you know, in, in the US, the, the best way to get recognized is to have Apple or Google feature your app, right? They put it on their main page, it's where everyone's going, you get downloads. Same thing holds true for China, right? If you get featured by these app stores, then you're gonna drive a bunch of downloads. But ultimately speaking, the way that you get featured in China is by having a really a really strong relationship with those app stores and you pay them a bunch of money to do it. So it's, it's like you're kind of skipping some of the UA channels for China and just going right to the app store. So it's, it's different, right? It's basically like gaming, gaming the Apple store with the upfront contract, yeah, we're gonna game your store, and they're like, cool, we're gonna get paid a lot when you do that. So um, it's, it's it's very very different. But know someone there, know someone who knows the space, and then do it that way. Another question? Whoever gets the mic first here, right here. Okay. Do, you, do you guys think that uh, eventually ad networks should turn to be uh, completely transparent? meaning showing you all the sub-publisher IDs. And if you do think that it's going to happen, who do you think is going to be the first one that's going to lead this uh, um, direction? I, I think transparency is super important. I mean, you said, you said sub-publisher IDs. I mean, we'll, we'll give you sub-IDs all day long. Do you want them identified, though? That's a different story. So I think that's what you were getting at. Because I'll give you every single sub ID you want. We do. We want that, right? We're, we're trying to do LTV optimization for you. We want to know as much as possible. I think transparency is important to a T, right? Right now where we are in the space, it's an, it's an, interesting, it's an interesting evolution where um, as much as people have a very cool tech, most of these companies are service companies, right? And a service company is successful based on the strength of their relationships and their ability to navigate the space for you. So um, you, you put your trust into an investment advisor because he knows what are the best stocks to pick for you. And you basically say, okay, you manage my fund. Here is $100,000. I hope you return that money for me tenfold, right? But he's not gonna call you up and be like, hey, is it cool if I invest in Vanguard or if I invest in this, right? I know I took a finance turn, I'm sorry. But you put your faith in people because they've proven to you that they know exactly what they're doing and they can do it fast and they can do it quickly, right? So transparency, I think, is important to to a T or to, to an extent, but ultimately, that's not what the key factor is, right? Key factor is being able to track your spend and tracking your return. So I don't care where it's going as long as I can say this user drove me this much value and I spent this much, right? But ultimately, I think transparency is important. If you have a good enough relationship with someone, we'll open up the list. You know, if you have a strong relationship, if, you, if you've proven, like if you've proven to us that you're going to work with us, you have no need of undercutting us, we'll, we'll, we'll open the books for you, right? There's nothing wrong with that once that level of trust is there, right? Transparency is all about trust. What do you think of uh, using it like a mobile messaging network to get your users for you? I think it's pretty rad. I mean, why not, right? If, if you've got, I mean, you, you look at the Korean market and the Japanese markets, they basically just build apps for Line and KakaoTalk and then you, you play it there, right? So you look at Tango here in the States, they originally were just, you, they made games specifically to play with someone while you were messaging them, right? And now they have games where you can build it on their platform. I think that's a pretty cool idea. It's the same, it's the same idea as why we would market our games for you in messaging apps. One of, our, one of our largest subsets of publishers are messaging apps, right? We work with them because they have this great reach because they have got people who are coming in and out of the app on a regular basis. They're used to seeing messages. Here's a message to go download. So I believe very strongly in working with messaging apps to get your message out. I think it largely depends on you know your strategy and what's your goal. Is your goal like revenue right now? Do you want to how much control do you want to have? It really varies by region by region. For example, um, in Korea, you might find it like really difficult to distribute it yourself because um, you know it takes there's there's a lot of relationships that need to be done need to be built there. It's a very agency focused like um, area, and um, you know cacao is a really easy way to make a buck and to get your apps distributed. But um, you know working with these platforms or these um, these texting apps. Um, you know, they also demand a lot of control, exclusivity, and things like that. You just gotta 
um, figure out if it aligns with your business goals and your business strategy. So it's got a very 20 or 30 percent too, right? right? Yeah, exactly. Do you want it to be your app or do you want it to be someone else's app? Uh, more questions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right, what's your best tip for the audience then? You first, James. <laughs> my best tip. Um, <laughs> what is my best tip? The takeaway from the panel, the, the whole sort of reason that they came. I would say, so one um, big theme, theme is people are, you know, developers are very, conscious of like sort of fraud and like just being careful where um, you know where things are coming from where your, where your traffic is coming from um, you know I would say my biggest tip is only use sort of reputable reputable channels reputable networks and sources that um, that you understand the pubs that you understand um, so make sure you know when we work when we work with third parties such as AppLift um, you know we make sure that they uh, you know they're a trusted partner of ours that they they vet every partner that they that every immediate partner that they work with um, screen them or whitelist them and have a process that we understand that we both agree on um, because you know things can get out of control and you might not know where um, where certain things are coming from or why fraud is happening or why these all why these clicks are happening um, when when you didn't buy them so the rule of thumb is always know what you're buying and um, sort of I would say just trust trust the make sure there's a, a strong level of trust with every single partner that, that you work with Ready? I can give it again. Yeah, you seem excited. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of you know just what we do, I think one of the things that's helpful for the developers that we work with is understanding our audience. You know, why did they come to our site? Are they passionate? You know, do they engage on our site at a level that's that's you know off the charts? And will that translate into your app? Um, we're a little bit different from from AppLift in that you know we're sort of just a suite of um, sites that you know, Publishers Clearinghouse has a lotto game, a blackjack game. We kind of create our own content, and then within that site, you know, we've got tons of users coming each month, and and we're actually, to your point, very transparent. You know, we'll show you the properties, we'll show you um, what the user experiences, the ad units, and things like that. But we're just in a little bit different of a position there. So um, I, you know, if you can get to know the um, place where your ad's going to be placed, you know, and if that user seems like it's going to be a great fit, like we've had a lot of success with social casinos, right? Our users come and enter for chances to win sweepstakes and they play lotto cards and, you know, it seems like a natural fit that a social casino would, would do well there. So then we drive really high CPIs for those partners and, you know, when you look at the back end, they're like, wow, you're one of our top quality providers, you know, because it's a very natural fit. So I think if you can kind of do your due diligence in some cases and find partners that might have a fit, you know, with your game, you know, based on the audience that that's going to be seeing the ads, I think in a lot of those cases, you're going to have a great, you know, opportunity to achieve success. So I kind of vet out each opportunity differently. You know, it's not a one size fits all approach. You kind of have to go in and, and test the waters differently each time. All right, Andrew. Um, uh, first things first, I say this a lot. Um, build an app that is fun and cool and exciting first. Build the experience first, and then focus on monetization later. Um, but the, to touch on what, what James said, it's about trust. And this is a relationship, right? So when you're working with someone, if you're looking to find UA, it's about constant contact. It's about working lockstep with that partner to drive those users for you, right? If you wanna have someone who's on your behalf at, out in the market, then have that open conversation with them. Talk to them every single day, right? Some people are like, oh, I, 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 I'm getting calls left and right, that's great. I always wanna talk to you. I wanna know exactly what your pain points are and what your successes are so that I can help maximize the successes and minim minimize the, the downfall, right? So have open communication, really trust in that partner, build that rapport, and then in turn, that's gonna help drive your business long-term, right? So share data, right? If you are asking me to go out and find you a user that's equal to X, then share those in-app events with us. Send me, let me know that this channel is driving this, this channel has this many in-app purchases, et cetera, and then I can go out and optimize for you, right? The more you make this a partnership, the more you make this a relationship, rather than just a, a, a client 
relationship, it's going to really help pay off in spades, right? You, you, you can work with 150 different people, or you can very, very successfully work with five. You know, or, or you know, I'd like to say one or two, but uh, you can work with a handful of people and get so much more out of a deep relationship as opposed to a very shallow but wide relationship. Uh, so I think we're out of time, but can we do another question? Or? He seems so excited. We should let him ask the question. All righty, go ahead. It's got to be good, though. <laughs> All right. Thank you for doing this. This was extremely helpful. I don't know if the mic's on. Uh, how do you think about the optimal payback period for which you measure the cash against? Obviously, if you're willing to be paid back in two years versus a year, you can spend more to acquire a customer. But, you know, your retention rates, your ARPU might decay a little bit. So how do you, when you guys are doing it internally, What's the optimal payback period for? Yeah, sure. So, okay. Um, so, anyways, that totally varies by game by game. Like, it's, it's you, I think, you know, sort of a BS answer, but you know that that is how it is. We we run a portfolio of games across a lot of different genres, from puzzle, puzzle, social casino, um, to uh, you know, we have we have mid core games, etc. But each of them has a different payer profile, and some of them are you know front loaded in terms of um, where we get our revenue. Some of them, like for example, um, Bubble Mania has 400 plus levels, so we do expect you know a longer time frame, more than six months, to, to sort of recoup that revenue. And um, for us, we even sort of um, have users that play multiple games, so they sort of have a network value. So it's really really difficult to um, say that there's a very specific lifetime or a time that you expect to recoup it. I think it de depends on your game design. Like you, sh you should design it a certain way. If you want to structure your mechanics to recoup it in three months, then um, you, know, you should optimize towards that period. But that's, that depends on you. When do you need to have your money back? Um, if you, I think if you can stretch out the, uh, the player life cycle, um, I would opt for more engagement and uh, sort of deeper, deeper gameplay than an than a upfront, um, upfront sort of monetization period. So um, that's, you know, that's sort of what I would aim towards if it was me designing the game.